Hi, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone from beautiful Cleveland, Ohio. Super excited to have everybody on, and uh, this is a great topic, and we are so glad that you could join us. Let's call up our slides. So um, we got a great event for you tonight, uh, led by my code activity directors, Dr. David Rosen, and Dr. Michael Valente. We're going to talk about rectal cancer and actually some of the more maybe a little bit what used to be controversial, but no, hopefully is a little bit more cutting edge in terms of how we manage our rectal cancer patients. Next slide. We are always super excited. And the reason I said good morning, good afternoon, good evening is we have over 700 healthcare providers joining us from over 80 different countries, as you can see in this map that Rita puts together. And I'm just always amazed by this and just super glad that each of you could join us. And along with that, we want this program to be as interactive as possible. So we encourage you to use the chat box to send in your comments, your questions. We're going to try to get after them. And, and then obviously, if there's something that we don't touch on or that is a little bit unclear, to go ahead and uh, email us or email Rita, and we'll try to get back to you after that. Next slide. I must say that we couldn't do this without our corporate sponsors, and we want to thank them so much for their generosity in providing uh, educational grants for our 2023 series. Uh, we could not hold this and offer CME for many of you without our industry sponsors, and a huge thank you to Medtronic and Janssen, Cook, and Olympus Corporation of the Americas. Um, thank you very much. Next slide. We have a great faculty and panel tonight, um, and you can see each of them here. So um, Dr. David Rosen is our chief of the section of colon and rectal cancer on our west side at Cleveland Clinic Fairview Hospital. Uh, he's been with us for several years. Uh, Dr. Michael Valente uh, is our actually our program director for our fellowship um, and uh, specializes in um, leading our stage four in our cytoreductive reductive and hypex surgery. Um, super excited to have both of them as co-activity directors. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Gunter has been with us for several years, trained with us. We are super excited to keep her here, one of our staff colorectal surgeons uh, on our east side campus, uh, leading the way there, one of our robotic experts. Uh, Dr. Ariel Canters, who is the assistant program director of our fellowship, also specializes in robotics and rectovaginal fistulas, colorectal cancer. And then finally, Dr. David Liska, who is the James Church and Edward DeBartolo Jr. Chair in Colorectal Surgery. He leads our Weiss Center, as well as our, um, our Young Onset Colorectal Cancer Center of Excellence, one of the few in the nation. So we're extremely excited to have each of our panelists and to share their wisdom with you. We're gonna have an interactive session. We're gonna have ability to go through a couple of cases and we encourage you to weigh in on each of those. We'll circle back to this, but I think it's important that everybody understands if you just very quickly call up the next slide is that you'll get this information at the end. You don't have to do it right now, but we're gonna have an ability to have CME. So expect to get something uh, from Rita about CME and you'll get these instructions, nothing you need to do right now. And then again, join us for upcoming programs and um, David and Mike will go over that at the end of the case of what is coming up. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. David Rosen uh, to lead us off and Let's look forward to a great evening. Thanks, Dr. Steele. Uh, appreciate the introduction and the kind words. Very excited to have you all here with us for a great uh, session tonight. We're gonna, in terms of an outline, we're gonna start off with a few uh, lectures on some of the more uh, cutting edge types of things, as Dr. Steele mentioned, associated with rectal cancer and its management. And then following that, we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna lead us in a, a case discussion of several cases, try to stump this panel and uh, uh, lead everybody through some, uh, some cool cases that I don't have exactly one right answer. So with that, I'm gonna uh, kick it over to Dr. Cantors, who's gonna get it started for us talking about total neoadjuvant therapy. Thank you, uh, let me just share my slides. All right, so uh, I will, I'm Ari Cantors. I am one of uh, the uh, younger staff here at the Cleveland Clinic, and I'm very fortunate and excited to talk to you guys about total neoadjuvant therapy today. Thankfully, it is becoming less of a cutting edge technology, um, but in order for us to understand how we've gotten here, it's important that we understand where we came from. So when we think about the history and development of advancements in, in rectal cancer therapy, we think back to the 1980s is when we really start to first understand rectal cancer pathology from a surgical standpoint. In 1985, 1986, that's kind of where we had some really big breakthrough, breakthroughs. Uh, 1986 actually was when we first started to discuss total mesorectal excisions. So actually excising the entire uh, lymph node or mesorectal envelope around the rectum in order to decrease local recurrence. 1985, 
was the first introduction of adjuvant therapy. Um, in this situation, we started noticing that with uh, the first the, the delivery of um, any sort of therapy up front, we can have the potential of decreasing local recurrence and decreasing or increasing disease free survival. Or sorry, not up front, after disease free survival. In the 1980s, uh, there was a Swedish rectal cancer trial um, put out in 97, um, which demonstrated with neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy, there was a decreased local recurrence and interestingly, an increased five year overall survival. Now, the later German rectal cancer trial did not show the same increase in overall survival. And, and part of the thought process is that TOME hadn't been globally adopted in 97 during the Swedish rectal cancer trial. And so it's possible that the radio uh, therapy was actually uh, accommodating for this suboptimal surgical um, technique. Initially, with this uh, an introduction of you know, adjuvant chemoradiotherapy, we started to see um, a pathologic complete response within these rectal cancer patients, including about uh, up to about 10 to 30 percent of patients with a complete um, pathologic clinical response. Uh, importantly, though, we did still see this higher rate of distant metastases. So we were losing the bet. We while we were gaining a benefit locally, we were losing a, be a benefit uh, systemically that we now can see today. This is a nice. You'll get all these slides later, but here's kind of a nice outline um, looking at the timeline and of where we were and where we are now today. So if we think about this traditional neoadjuvant therapy, so this is when we first started to introduce the concept of putting a chemo radiotherapy up front. Um, it would be a diagnosis and then hopefully an initiation of keto chemo radiotherapy within the first two weeks uh, and treating for a five to six week daily. So a 25 to 28 fraction um, uh, radiotherapy with chemo sensitization, waiting about six to eight weeks to get full effect of the chemo radio radiation and then proceeding to surgery with a TME excision. After the fact, waiting about eight weeks for recovery in the event of no post-operative complications and patient tolerance, there would be initiation of systemic chemotherapy for approximately six months. Now, this means that in the best case scenario, it would be about five and a half months between diagnosis and initiation of therapy. What's important is that while this post-operative chemo was recommended by NCCN guidelines, um, less than 50% of eligible patients were actually receiving it due to delays, um, due to complications, treatment compliance, et cetera. And so then in theory, the full completion of therapy would take almost a year. Within this group, we're seeing about a 16 to 20% complete pathologic response rate. So this is just kind of spelled out a little more clearly, clearly five to six weeks of, ther of radiation therapy with 25 to 28 fractions um, with a total of 4,500 to 5,048 uh, C gray. And then using chemotherapy as a sensitizing agent, generally 5-FU um, and then a delay in, in and surgery. Now, in 2015, a group um, group led by um, uh, Julio uh, or Julio Garcia Aguilar started to look at the delivery of not only neoadjuvant chemo radiotherapy but also chemotherapy. Um, within this group, they saw that um, with the addition of a systemic therapy, we have an opportunity to decrease the metastatic disease. And this was one of the bigger issues with the earlier trial. So initially, it looked like we were having about a 25% complete response rate. But then more recently, we've seen a 20 to 40% pathologic complete response. Sorry, we're seeing a pathologic complete response rate of 20 to 40%. So within this TNT group, the therapy regimen um, is and we can we'll talk a little bit more about short course versus long course, but a five to six week long course of chemo radiation with. Uh, sensitizing uh, 5-FU, then waiting about a two to four um, week for recovery followed by with interval surveillance imaging, followed by 16 weeks of systemic ther therapy. So this is where that we get the benefit of treating not only the local disease, but the systemic disease. And then four, four to eight weeks after chemotherapy, taking someone to the operating room. So rather than about a year long course, we're dealing with only about a 30 week course, and that's a complete course. So, with the initiation of TNT, we're starting to see these higher rates of um, chemotherapy completion. So, you're not relying on a patient recovering from surgery, avoiding postoperative complications, et cetera, before you can initiate their systemic therapy. 
Within that, we're also then seeing less time with an ileostomy. So with radiation to the pelvis, performing a protective loop ileostomy with a colorectal anastomosis, um, you would have to wait until after completion of chemotherapy before reversal. So instead, it's just a traditional eight to eight to four eight to twelve weeks after surgery that you can reverse this ileostomy. There's also a shorter treatment duration. Instead of about a twelve month period, we're looking at only about thirty weeks, and then. Convene, uh, impressively, an Im increased pathologic complete response rate and also a, a complete clinical response rate, which within we can end up uh, initiating the opportunity for a watch and wait. So there's potentially a co whole cohort of patients that will either result in a downstaging of their, their of their tumor, so meaning they have to require a less um, morbid operation, taking someone potentially from an APR to an LAR, or even those who have complete response in that they never potentially even need an operation and they can be initiated into a close, close surveillance um, protocol. So that's with the traditional long course chemo uh, TNT. There's also a short course TNT. Um, Dr. Rosen may wanna debate in a little bit later about the benefits of a short course ra chemo radiation. Um, but in this situation, we deal with only a five therapy as opposed to a five to six weeks of therapy. In this situation, there are larger uh, radiation doses in a shorter number, a smaller number of fractions, only five fractions, and then only a total of 2,500 C gray. In this situation, there's no chemotherapy sensitizing agent. And then, um, and traditionally with short course, just chemo radiation, there would be surgery within one week, but instead with TNT, you'll also have chemotherapy. In this situation, you have a couple of benefits, including compliance for the patient and just a radiation from a radiation standpoint. Also, for patients who have to travel for therapy, for example, those who live rurally, their patient location is not as much of a factor. You don't need to be available for five full weeks of therapy, but rather five days. And then within that, there's also potentially less cost to the patient, less um, time spent away from work, et cetera. So in this situation, looking at a short course versus a long course TNT, we're taking someone from about a 30 week therapy course to about a 23 week therapy course and saving them five, approximately four to five weeks of total therapy. The data behind this, there's two big trials that we like to quote in terms of supporting the TNT, uh, total neoadjuvant therapy. First is the RAPIDO trial. In this situation, we in this study, we had patients randomly assigned to um, one of two different arms. There's a short course radiation followed by a full neoadjuvant chemotherapy and then surgery two to four weeks after versus a traditional long course chemo radiation followed by surgery followed by adjuvant chemotherapy. And mind you, in this situation, there is a difference in, ke in rate chemo radiation. In one case, you had a short course um, versus a long course. Um, but earlier studies have shown a near equivalence between short course and long course chemo radiation. Uh, by by itself, as long as there was a delay before surgery. With, with the rapido with the rapido trial, um, with the disease related treatment failure, um, only twenty three point seven percent of the sh of those within the TNT group, the short course group, saw disease related tra related treatment failure, whereas thirty percent of those in the traditional standard of care long chemo radiation and then adjuvant therapy group, um, with the most common cause of failure was with distant metastases. So again, we're, see we're seeing the benefit of systemic therapy. Um, we saw only 20% of the, uh, uh, distant metastases within the short course TNT group, whereas we saw almost 27% in the traditional standard of care group. We also, um, though we saw a higher rate of preoperative adverse effects um, with the short course group, uh, with 48% versus 25% preoperatively, there was a significant amount of uh, adverse effects within the adjuvant therapy group, those who had to receive chemotherapy afterwards, 34%. Then we've got the protege trial. This has most recently been published. Um, and in this situation, we're looking at um, um, an induction chemotherapy, full furanox, followed by a long course chemoradiotherapy, followed by surgery. And then within this group, a, co a Group of patients would ultimately require adjuvant therapy compared to a long course chemo radiation. This is similar to the second arm of the Rapido trial, followed by surgery, followed by chemotherapy. In this group, impressively, we saw a 28% pathologic complete response with TNT compared to only 12% with standard of care. And this is very much mirrored in the Rapido trial, which where we saw a 28% um, complete response versus um, versus a 14%. 
And then we so within the disease, uh, three year disease free survival, uh, 75% with the TNT group and 67, 68.5% within the standard of care group. Within the um, adverse events, we saw only we saw about equivalent for the entire course of therapy with 27% in TNT versus 22% in standard of care. But then importantly, thinking about those who require chemotherapy adjuvantly, there's about 11% versus 23%. And thank you, Dr. Rosen. I got a good text. You made a very good point. I'm, I, uh, within short course, there's no sensitizing agent. I believe I said chemo radiation within short course, and I should have said just radiation therapy. So, thinking about TNT, some important takeaway points. TNT um, allows for an improved compliance. You have patients who don't have to recover from a very morbid, very invasive operation, such as a proctectomy, um, in order to complete their both their, ther their radiation and their chemotherapy. There's also a decreased duration of an ileostomy. We don't have to wait for completion of chemotherapy before the stomach can be reversed. And this can have a very significant impact on a patient's quality of life and overall emotional state. There's also an opportunity for downstaging within the TNT group. So potentially those who would otherwise require sphincter sacrifice, they can end up in going from an APR to an LAR um, proctectomy and will have sphincter preservation. We also see an increased complete clinical response and the opportunity for patients to actually be enrolled within a watch and wait strategy and potentially avoid surgery altogether. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cantors, for that great update on TNT. Um, great job. Uh, next up, I'd like to present uh, our co-host, uh, our man from Boston, Massachusetts, Dr. David Rosen. Dr. Rosen is the, uh, the section head of colorectal surgery at the Fairview Hospital. Um, Dr. Rosen is going to be talking about lateral pelvic lymph node dissection and uh, some fancy things that he's doing with the robot out there on Fairview. Dr. Rosen. Thanks, Mike. Gonna share my slides here. All right, speaking of Boston, everybody's just as excited as me. See the Celtics up 2-0 in the series, the Bruins up 1-0. It's a good time to be a Boston sports fan, but that's not what we're talking about here tonight. We're going to talk here about, I'm going to get going with a quick uh, little 10 to 15 minute intro on lateral pelvic lymph node dissection, what that means, how that applies to rectal cancer. This is one of the uh, bigger controversies that we see, especially when you compare the East versus the West. And so we're going to get into that a little bit. So I think it helps by defining the anatomy. What is the lateral, what are lateral pelvic lymph nodes? What are these compartments? And when we're looking at it and dealing with rectal cancer, we're really talking about internal iliac nodes and obturator nodes. You can see here in this diagram, uh, you see the common iliac artery coming down and, and uh, branching in the internal and external iliac arteries. And that really helps you define the obturator lymph node component, which component, which is lateral to that internal iliac arterial branch where you can see the obturator nerve coursing through. And uh, medial to that is where the internal iliac lymph nodes uh, lie. So those are the areas that we're talking about. This is outside of the natural mesorectal dissection that we do for rectal cancer. And why is this important? Well, the, it's important because when you have a distal rectal cancer, and we're not talking about a proximal rectal cancer, but a distal rectal cancer, you think about at least definitely below the anterior peritoneal reflection, you have two different um, areas of, of lymphatic drainage. You have the typical that we superior rectal and inferior mesenteric basin that leads up to the periaortic nodes that we always think about taking out with our high ligation the inferior mesenteric artery and our total meals rectal excision. But you also have the middle and inferior rectal basin that drains to the iliac nodes from our uh, uh, middle and inferior rectal arteries. As you can see here in the diagram, a lot of uh, things going on, but down low you can see uh, especially what drains up to the, when you get to the middle and infer inferior uh, rectal arteries, that'll drain up towards the iliac arteries and up towards the uh, iliac nodes. So, rectal cancer, sur cancer surgery, in general, where we have failed historically has been in the pelvis. And historically, it was due to failures in technique. And kind of as Dr. Cantors was talking about, we, we, as we've, time has gone on and we've gotten into this total mesorectal excision, this has really resulted in a decrease in local recurrence. This technique with a high ligation inferior mesenteric artery, a total mesorectal excision, completely clears the superior rectal and the inferior mesenteric nodes that I just talked about there. So now following this, along with some of the new adjuvant therapies we talked about, such as radiation therapy, the most common site of local recurrence 
is the lateral pelvic sidewall, those internal iliac or obturator nodes. And so the question is, is this recurrent disease or is this untreated disease? So the incidence of positive lateral pelvic lymph nodes varies across the literature, but somewhere in the, in the range probably of seven to 24% for patients with rectal cancer. The Mercury study quoted about an, a, a, a number of 11.7% that they saw in their imaging detected study. We know that the risk of having positive lateral pelvic lymph nodes is higher with distal lesions, so especially distal to the anterior peritoneal reflection, as well as larger uh, uh, lesions such as T3 or T4. Their presence is definitely a poor prognostic indicator. The Mercury studies show the 42% survival of patients with lateral pelvic lymph nodes versus 70% without. So the philosophy of how to deal with these lateral pelvic lymph nodes really differs depending on what part of the world you're in. In Japan and the western portion, uh, eastern portion of the world, excuse me, the a lateral pelvic lymph node dissection is very common. It's actually part of their standard technique and their standard workup for uh, rectal cancer. In Japan, the internal iliac, the obturator lymph nodes, the external iliac, and the common iliac lymph nodes are all considered regional disease. They're not considered metastatic disease, which differs from here. And so oftentimes in, the, in Japan, they, it, the standard for these distal large cancers is to perform upfront a total mucous rectal excision with a bilateral uh, lateral pelvic node uh, dissection, and they're less, um, um, they use less neoadjuvant therapy than we do in the West. Like I mentioned, in, the, in Western portions of the world, North America, Europe, Australia, there's a big component of starting usually with some kind of neoadjuvant therapy, some kind of TNT typically, and especially now is how we've uh, uh, transferred to. Starts with chemo radiation typically. Here at Cleveland Clinic, our TNT's typical TNT strategy is long course chemo radiation followed by consolidation chemotherapy. So there are other regimens where you can flip that around or do short course radiation as Dr. Cancers was mentioning. One of the big differences is our stage in the AJCC only classifies internal iliac nodes as regional disease, but common iliac, external iliac are considered metastatic disease. So a little bit different classification system. So as I was mentioning in the East, total mucosal rectal excision and prophylactic bilateral pelvic lymph node dissection is standard for all stage two and three tumors. So all tumors that are greater than T, that are either T3 or T4, and below the peritoneal reflection. The reason is that the thought process, the philosophy there is that they really question the effectiveness of new adjuvant therapy on these sidewall nodes. In the West, however, we feel a little bit more strongly about new adjuvant chemo radiation. We, as, as we feel that this area, the lateral pelvic compartments are treated with that new adjuvant therapy. You can debate on how well they are compared to the mesorectum, but that they are covered with their chemo radiation with our new adjuvant therapy. And then we think about performing a selective lateral pelvic lymph node dissection. So, if those are the philosophies, how did we get there? So, part of the problem is how do we define positive lymph nodes? And the main way that we do it now is by imaging, by a preoperative MRI. As we've shifted to MRI and MRI has been better and better, we're able to pick up on these things uh, better than we were previously. So, the main features that we look at in MRI, one is size criteria. Usually, we're looking at the short axis. If it's greater than or equal to a centimeter or 10 millimeters, then we know that the lateral occurrence rates is 30 to 60%, so very high. So I think anyone with a, a short axis node greater than 10, greater than equal to 10 millimeters, definitely that's considered a positive node. Some radiologic studies even drop that down to greater or equal to seven millimeters and still have a fairly high lateral recurrence rate. So some would argue we should make that number, that cutoff, seven millimeters. And then postoperatively, what happens after you treat them and they go away? If nodes are still there and, and, and suspicious on a post-treatment, a post new adjuvant treatment MRI, I think we could all say, yeah, those are still there. Those are likely positive. Something needs to be done about them. But what about if they go away? So one recent MD Anderson study looked at and found that greater than or equal to five millimeters post new adjuvant therapy, those have a 64.7% chance of being pathologic. So that's kind of one figure that's out there in the literature in terms of what we should be looking at. Other MRI features that define positive lymph nodes are the shape, the border, heterogeneity, and signal intensity. The only study, the only prophylactic randomized control study done, done looking at uh, lateral pelvic lymph node dissection is the JCOG 0212 study, which is a mesorectal excision with or without lateral lymph node dissection for clinical stage two or three lower rectal cancer. So this was a non-inferiority randomized control trial. It looked at cancers that had rectal cancers that were greater than or equal, at least T3, and distal to the peritoneal reflection. And of note, there were no enlarged lateral pelvic lymph nodes on imaging. So these were being done. What was being compared is a total mesorectal excision to a total mesorectal excision plus a lateral pelvic lymph node dissection. And again, this is being done prophylactically, not any, no imaging concerns for positive lymph nodes. What they found was that TME was alone was not inferior. 
However, there was a local recurrence because it was a non Fourier trial, but there was a, a, a increase, excuse me, a lower local recurrence in the patients that got the prophylactic lymph node dissection, 12.6% versus 7.4%. But this wasn't enough to uh, uh, claim non inferiority of TME to TME plus lateral pelvic lymph node dissection. Following these patients out a little bit longer, there's no difference between these two groups in five or seven year recurrence free survival. Of note, the lateral pelvic lymph node dissection resulted in the higher blood loss, longer operating room times. And what we all worry about, I think, with this technique is complications. So, systematic reviews have shown that one of five patients undergoing a lateral pelvic lymph node dissection have a major complication. There are a lot of vascular structures in this compartment, nerve structures. If you're not familiar with this technique or haven't done it, it's a very scary place to be operating just because it's unfamiliar territory. You can have an increased risk of sexual dysfunction given the uh, nerve structures. Uh, in this area, same with urinary dysfunction and bowel dysfunction. So, what our algorithm says, and you know, we talked about the JCOG trial, but what I always stress about that trial is that was looking at patients without evidence of any uh, positive disease on, on preoperative imaging. So, what we've kind of adapted is that we do not do any prophylactic lateral pelvic lymph node dissection. We do have a multidisciplinary tumor board discussion at all stages of treatment. We get initial staging MRI. If the initial staging MRI has radiologically suspicious lateral pelvic lymph nodes, then we go on our standard course would be a total neoatomeric course with long course chemo radiation followed by consolidation chemotherapy. We then do an interval imaging check between chemo radiation and consolidation chemotherapy to check the response to make sure we're responding. And if we are responding between that chemo radiation and consolidation chemotherapy, we then continue with the consolidation uh, chemotherapy. Following the completion of all that TNT, all that new adjuvant therapy, we then repeat an MRI prior to discussing what's our next uh, move. Is there someone who has completely responded? We can talk about watching weight. Is there someone that we should that has not responded and we need to talk about surgical resection? So if the suspicious lymph nodes remain on MRI, one criteria would be that you know greater than five millimeter, greater than equal to five millimeter lymph node, like I talked about from that MD Anderson study, then we will do a lateral pelvic lymph node dissection performed of that compartment with the suspicious nodes in addition to a TME. If the, if the lymph nodes disappear, however, following new adjuvant therapy, then you really need to individualize the decision. Is this someone where there's still disease somewhere else? What is the patient's, uh, you know, their age, their comorbid conditions? Are you going for surgery or someone who's doing watch and wait? And that's gonna really uh, help individualize and guide what you're gonna do about that previously positive lymph node compartment. This is something that's definitely challenging, um, these patients have, you know, it's a poor prognostic indicator. These patients have advanced disease. Um, and that's something that, you know, you need to take into consideration when dealing with these patients. So thanks very much for tuning into that portion. Uh, I'm going to hand it back over to, um, you know, keep the comments coming in the chat. We're going to address those in a little bit. I'm going to hand it back over to uh, Dr. Valente. He's going to talk to us about stage four disease and the role of HIPEC in rectal cancer. Thank you, David. Great talk. Thanks for, uh, being under on time, because as you know, I tend to go over at times, so I'm going to make sure I'm not today. But let me share my screen here. All right. Very good. And what we're going to be talking about today is uh, cytorectal surgery, high pec, but in the setting, overall setting, but also with rectal cancer as kind of a focus. And just an FYI, the, the studies out there are always quoting colorectal uh, carcinomatosis or peritoneal disease from colorectal. The colorectal component or the rectal cancer surgery component is very small, and we'll talk about that. No disclosures. So, you know, the term carcinomatosis is used extensively and widely, but we don't like that term uh, in what I do. It's more colorectal peritoneal metastasis. And really, we don't know what the true incidence, incidence is. Uh, if you look at some old ALTAPS reports, one in five with adenocarcinoma had peritoneal spread and up to one half with mucinous histology. As we know, mucinous tumors tend to spread a little bit more in the peritoneal cavity, perforation, et cetera, up to 50% of those patients on autopsy. About five to 10% will be, will be synchronous. We'll know it at the time of diagnosis and another 15 to 30% will show up, you know, a year later or two. I see uh, categories in both, in both areas. And like I said, only about 10 to 15% of peritoneal metastasis comes from the rectal origin. And why is that? Well, as we know, two thirds of the rectum is, you know, retro or uh, not in the peritoneal cavity, extra peritoneal. Uh, so really that that upper rectum and those big tumors straddling the reflection uh, are the ones that, that may spread into the abdominal cavity. Just a quick background really quick on cytorectal surgery and HIPEC in general. I just, I like this slide to show all surgeons 
throughout the country and the world that if you have colorectal peritoneal mets and and you and you found you know about it preoperatively met that be on a cat scan mri etc you know you you should refer to someone or a center that does peritonectomies and cytorectal surgery plus or minus high pack so if you know that patient has mets already through the peritoneum you know, confer with another uh, individual or, or center that may be able to give more guide, guidance on that. Now, if you find out that there's peritoneal disease at the time of the operation, say you went in for a, you know, a robotic low anterior or a laparoscopic right colectomy, but you get in there and, oh my gosh, there's disseminated disease. Less is more, less is more, less is more. Please don't disrupt those planes open up the retroperitoneum, take out that big, huge sequel cancer, but leave the rest of the disease behind. Unless they are obstructed or impending obstruction or hemorrhaging, then you could do something. So really, no resection, limited resection if there's impending obstruction, maybe just a stoma, take some biopsies, do a PCI, a peritoneal carcinomatosis index, essentially explore the extent, take pictures, do a good op note, and then refer to someone or some center who may be able to help them uh, more. And then if this is someone who's had a colon or rectal cancer and then we're a year or two out and we have metachronous lesions, that those are great cases to be sent to a, a center or, or center who, who can do peritoneal uh, surgery. So some of the risk factors as you see here, large tumors, perforated tumors, uh, signet ring cell, emergency surgery. A lot of these you'll see can happen with these rectal sigmoid or upper rectal obstructing tumors where they can perforate, but this can happen anywhere in the colon, but these are our big risk factors. There's been some studies as of late looking at if we should do prophylactic HIPEC in these patients, and none of those studies have shown that we should be doing that. Uh, so colorectal peritoneal mets, historically five to seven months with the good old fashioned chemotherapy. Um, but if you look at modern full Fox type chemotherapy, really about 16 months versus if you have mets to the liver, you may have a 19 month or lung up to 25 months. So peritoneal disease, Second most common site of metastatic spread in colorectal cancer, uh, but the worst overall outcome. And this is what I was saying with modern chemotherapy paper from 2016. With modern full Fox, about 16 months of survival. This is without surgery, just systemic chemotherapy, looking at a 4.25 year overall survival. Very dismal. So these isolated peritoneal mets. So as I said, carcinomatosis, terminal vent. These are those patients that you know you can't do anything. Uh, with and and these are inoperable and these aren't the patients that we're talking about today. And when you talk about CRS and HIPEC, these are not the patients that we're looking for to help. However, about four to eight percent in the literature will have isolated or very limited disease without any systemic mets. And this is this highly select group which forms the basis for offering our aggressive surgical treatment. So it's this very small subset of patients. So over the last 15 years of a big evolution, a lot of people are picking up on it and doing it. There's a chance to potentially uh, help these patients out. Multiple retrospective, a few prospective trials. We'll talk about a few of them that have been in the, the news as the last few years. And in specialized centers, places that have been doing this for quite some time, they do show a potential cure in about 15% or so, meaning no disease at five years. Um, so I think there is hope for some of these patients. And if not a cure, we're at least alleviating a lot of uh, potential short-term disasters and making them live a little bit longer, of course. What's the rationale? Well, traditionally, cytorectal surgery, you know, the gross disease coming out, adding the chemotherapy, you usually do them together uh, in this situation. And, and the HIPEC, the chemotherapy, lots of research going on it, but it's hot liquid chemo. Uh, you get direct uh, agents to the cells. There's no systemic absorption, essentially. And we're having this, this, this direct treatment to these cells where systemic chemotherapy, if you think about it, if you're talking about two, three, four, five millimeter lesions on the peritoneum, that chemotherapy is probably not going to be very effective getting there. Uh, case selection, I'll just briefly go over it. Obviously, the patients are undergoing some large operations, but the number three here, the ability to resect all disease by far is the most important prognostic factor and looking forward is really the most important thing that I'm thinking about in these cases is can I get everything out? And you hear about the PCI. Um, I'll operate on folks with PCIs as high as 30, 35, but that's for alleviation of obstructions, problems that they may have, but I'm not delivering chemotherapy in those patients. So around the world, you'll see a PCI of 17. We'll go up to 20 or so. We don't really have a cutoff per se. It's a combination of factors. 
And that what I was talking about, that CC score, the completeness of cellular reduction, we're, ta we're not talking uh, big here. We're talking two, two and a half millimeters. So if you could get everything out with less than two and a half millimeters of things left behind, you have a complete uh, cellular reduction. And as you can see with cancer, your Kaplan-Meier curve here, as you go from C01 to two and three, your survival drops off uh, precipitously. Quickly, one of the first randomized controlled trials looking at uh, peritoneal mets from colorectal and appendix. A lot of these papers have appendix seal in them as well. Um, they looked at patients just with palliative surgery versus surgery going for, for complete debulking with 5-FU leucovorin, and they showed a, a, a big increase in survival of 22 versus 12 months. Uh, at an eight-year follow-up, they still so showed a 22-month versus 13-month disease-specific survival, and um, overall pretty darn good survival for these patients. A couple other studies looking at five-year survival in 660 patients, 26% versus another one, 58%. Some of the papers that have been pro-CRS and HIPEC over the years. Now, a lot of talk has been from the Prodigy or Prodi 7, the French multi-center uh, randomized open-label trial. This this one has been talked about extensively uh, over, over the last couple of years. It was an abstract and took about two to three years to get this published finally. Uh, in Lancet Oncology back in 21. Multi-center, 265 patients, you either got, uh, with high PCIs here, by the way, as well, you're randomized and uh, you either got uh, systemic complete side of surgery and you got chemo versus you didn't get chemo. Um, so post-op mortality low, morbidity, 60-day, all very similar. They show that a median overall survival for these patients in the uh, HIPEC group was 41.2 versus 41.7 in the non-HIPEC group. So both had good side reductive surgery and both showed uh, an excellent 41-month survival. So what this shows is uh, with really, really good surgery, you can increase survival uh, substantially. Uh, one thing, though, there's a subgroup analysis looking at the PCI of 11 to 15, which by, by way is a big majority of our patients, uh, a vast majority of patients. So they actually showed a much higher survival 41.6 versus 32 uh, in the patients who received the chemotherapy. Now, uh, also here, they did break it up and you see rectum 10% uh, with chemo, 11% without chemo. So once again, about 10 to 15% of all of these tumors are coming from the rectum itself. And, as you'll notice, all of these papers show colorectal metastasis. They don't really specify about the rectum in most of the papers, but we'll talk about a little bit why. So what we found from this paper is uh, your surgical technique and what you can reduce, set a reduce or reduction is the most important factor. The chemotherapeutic regimen that they used was oxaliplatinum for 30 minutes. Most of us in the United States, North America, we don't use that. We use uh, minomycin C for over uh, 90 minutes, and it's a much higher dose. So uh, it's not it's not really accepted, and a lot of places are going away from oxaliplatinum at this point. Part of it is they've been getting uh, full fox and oxaliplatinum is part of that mix, and they may be sensitized to that. So it's not working as well. Short high pack time, 30 minutes. So really what this said to everyone is we need more trials looking at this. Um, and I'll tell you that this trial turned a lot of heads, et cetera, but high pack is still going on. It's not a dead thing based on this trial. This trial had a lot of good that came out of it, but a lot of things that we can work on as well. So moving on though, what about, uh, talk about stage four disease. What about folks with uh, colorectal cancer, with the liver metastasis and, and peritoneal mets? Well, paper just recently, uh, 21 from DCR, Diseases in Colon Rectum, looked at synchronous liver resection and CRS and HIPEC. You know, and one of the reasons I think that rectal cancer patients may do worse in the big picture is a lot of these folks uh, end up having liver metastases and nodal metastases versus some of these large uh, sequel cancers or these T4 tumors. A lot of these rectal cancers go to, to the liver um, and or lungs. So I think in this paper, if you had a, a, a low PCI and you could achieve a complete set of reduction, liver resection was uh, acceptable. At one point, anything in the liver or was uh, considered contraindicated for high pack. But uh, we've done several here over the last uh, 16, 20 months where three, four, five different wedges, ablations, different kind of techniques. And we're, we're kind of um, set of reducing the entire abdominal cavity, giving high pack, doing liver resections. And uh, you know we'll see what our, our numbers show in the next three to five years. But overall, worst thir three and five year survival rates. And I'm thinking once again because of the the disease process itself, not because of the operation. Now, 
as I talked about, all these papers uh, throughout the last 20 years have really just showed colorectal cancer. So are they really two different diseases? Re we're talking about rectal cancer today. Um, and, and they are. And, and you'll have some papers here quoting that they do worse and you should do it under extreme caution and maybe shouldn't do rectal cancer uh, with HIPEC. And then we have a, a case control thing here that uh, that's similar outcomes. So we have colorectal, uh, we have both the colon versus the rectum, and they both do quite well depending on you know your 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 technique and how you're doing it. Once again, 2022 Asian Center looking at uh, rectal cancer specifically having good outcomes, and you have another paper saying that you shouldn't do it, and you have another paper here that says it's just the same. Don't worry about it. So. You know, like I said, they're rare tumors in terms of metastasis to the peritoneum, only about one in 10, one in, uh, one in 12. Um, so this is one systematic review, meta-analysis, looking at colon versus rectum. Are they one homogenous condition? Are they two different diseases? About 1,300 patients, over 1,100 were colonic and only 155 were rectal, going in line with 10%. Overall survival did show 49% for colon versus 24 for rectal. So there was a profound overall survival difference there. However, all the papers over the last 20 years have never really localized from that peritoneal reflection or from the anal verge where this is in the rectum or these mid-low high rectal tumors. We don't really know. So we're a lot of calls out there now saying we should have more standardization on reporting for rectal cancer. And once again, very low numbers overall. What about getting a little crazy and doing some total pelvic exoneration? Well, it's been done. Um, these so a lot of times that we think that these cancers are worse and doing worse is you know they're locally advanced uh, and, and they require a lot more care. Fourteen over fourteen years, three hundred nineteen CRSs and HIPEX, only uh, sixteen exonerations. They achieved one hundred percent complete site of reduction. R zero was eighty one percent for the rectal cancer. Uh, long median stay, high number of complications. And actually, a high reoperation rate. So, what do we think about doing exoneration, CRS, and HIPEC? Well, like I get, it's two very complex, different operations being performed at the same time. We've done a few here, uh, small numbers worldwide. I think in very select patients, it's uh, with a low disease burden. I think it's worth it, and it's worth a shot. Once again, though, high morbidity, uh, urological system has lots of leaks. What about rectal cancer, locally advanced or locally recurrent peritoneal disease? an IORT. Uh, so this paper uh, just recently is looking at 14 local recurrent, locally advanced rectal cancers and 16 local recurrent rectal cancers. Uh, overall survival 31 months, still in line with some of the data from, from the days in the last 10 years, high complication rate. Nonetheless, something that can be done, is it available at all places? No. Should it be done in everyone? No. But these are some of the things that are going on throughout the world with rectal cancer and peritoneal meds. They are two different disease processes, but in a specialized center with uh, proper uh, expertise, uh, these this can be accomplished with relatively good morbidity and outcomes. So some take home points in general, not just rectal cancer, but CRS and HIPEC may be beneficial in highly select patients. The low burden of disease and the completeness of the site of reduction is the most important prognostic indicators for these patients, colon or rectal or appendiceal, doesn't matter. The addition of HIPEC in, in Many patients will be beneficial. More data is needing because we don't know what the ideal drug regimen, regimens are. A lot of talk throughout the world about what, what should we do, be using and what we should get rid of. More to come on that. In terms of rectal cancer, there was a time when rectal cancer patients were not being evaluated for CRS and HIPEC if they have peritoneal meds. I think this, this is old thinking. We should be, as I tell my medical oncologists and my partners, every single patient with peritoneal meds should be evaluated by a, a, a group of people who can determine if maybe this is what they need versus just systemic therapy or palliative surgery. Uh, may have higher morbidity than less overall survival than colon or appendiceal. You could do exonerations in IORT in highly, highly select patients. Um, overall, CRS HIPEC, we're looking for an increase in survival, hopefully of one to two years for the most part. Cure, potentially in very, very select patients. Overall, very acceptable morbidity for CRS and HIPEC. It's not as bad as everyone thinks it may be. Early referral to a peritoneal malignancy center for evaluation is key. Uh, these are not patients that you should go in and do a low anterior and leave all that disease behind. Please don't do that. Prospective trials are obviously needed in multiple areas of, of this uh, and looking forward to helping with those in the future. Thank you very much for your attention.
Awesome talk, Dr. Valente. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm gonna, if our panelists can come back on screen, I'm gonna get going with some cases here, but. Dr. Rosen froze. All right. I think we're gonna start, am I still on here? Uh, yes, we're, we're gonna do some panels here. Um, well, Dr. Rosen will get back on. He's going to be leading that, but we'll, uh, while, while I can do it, I can actually go over yeah. some of the questions. David, you back? Sorry, was I cutting out there? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm connection. sure whatever you said was profound. It was. I was saying, the. so I was going to go over the audience questions, then we'll get to the cases here. Perfect, so I agree. A couple of great questions in the chat. One, um, Dr. Gunter, I'll start with you. You have a low rectal cancer that's involving the anal sphincter. You go through some neoadjuvant therapy, and it looks like it shrinks back and you're no longer involving the sphincter muscle. Are these patients, do you rely on your initial preoperative imaging and then say they got to get an APR? Or if this has retracted some, can you, would you entertain the idea of doing an ultra low LER with a coanal anastomosis? I think that's a great question. And it comes up a lot in our tumor board about should we use the, our preoperative imaging and staging or should we go on what? Um, they were able to achieve with their um, new adjuvant treatment. Um, I personally feel more comfortable going on their pre, uh, kind of their initial staging imaging about kind of where their cancer was. But I think with, you know, the whole idea with the German rectal cancer trial and things was, can we do organ preservation? So certainly I think it's something to consider with the discussion of your colleagues and tumor board about um, how aggressive to be, and certainly would require a very highly motivated patient to try for organ preservation, recognizing that you know we had some sense that there might be tumor involving the sphincter preoperatively. Um, I don't know that we have a clear answer about what the right thing to do is in this setting. I agree with you, and 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 you know I think I think most of us are probably more comfortable going off the preoperative imaging, right? It seems to be the more oncologically safe thing to do, um, and so but it's it's something that you take case by case. That's a difficult question. Next one, uh, Dr. Liska, we were asked about why we adopted the OPRA kind of protocol for our TNT strategy. Uh, another group was talking about how they use Rapido. Do you use, and in, in, is there, what was our rationale for sort of making that our standard? Um, and then also with those patients, do you do watch and wait on patients do, that do clinical, that have a complete clinical response? And so, so we were one of the centers that participated in an OPRA trial. Um, and so it was very natural for us to adapt the OPRA protocol. And before, you know, before we participate in OPRA trial, our standard protocol here was um, traditional long course chemo radi chemo radiation followed by surgery. Uh, we, you know, Rapido, while while it looks like it has great outcomes, it's it's different chemotherapy. It's also short course, so it was would be quite an adjustment for our oncologist, radiation oncologist, to switch over to the Rapido type protocol. But OPRA really for us, it was just the addition of systemic chemotherapy, which we were doing anyway, just in the past, we did it after surgery. Whereas with OPRA, we either did it, you know, as induction chemotherapy or then um, as consolidation chemotherapy. So it was kind of a much easier adjustment for all of us to include uh, the OPRA protocol as our TNT protocol. And then, yes, uh, you know, we started, we have been doing watch and wait up for patients, you know, well before OPRA. You know, on a case by case uh, basis, um, you know, mostly for patients who had long course chemo radiation and had a complete response after that. And, you know, from Oprah onwards, uh, watch and wait has become standard of care almost for our patients, where we, any patient who has a complete clinical response after TNT, we discuss with them the option of watch and wait. Obviously, it's not, you know, it's not for everyone and it's, it's a, you know, it needs to have a careful patient discussion. But if they do have a complete clinical response and multidisciplinary tumor board agrees with that assessment, then we offer watch and wait as an option. Great, thanks. Dr. Cantors, what about if you have positive paraaortic nodes above the IMA in a patient? Is this something you go after? Say there's no disease anywhere else. Um, the, the, the questioner talked about there's not really much guidance in the literature. Do you go after these paraaortics? What do you do with those? Phone a friend. Um, I talked to all my amazing partners. Uh, so I actually had a case like this yesterday. I went after them. Um, she had oligometastatic disease, very young patient. So in this particular situation, we thought we had an opportunity. Um, she was a sigmoid cancer, admittedly, but we did go after them. Um, so, yes, <laughs> as long I think, as I think I could do it safely. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. You know, it's patient dependent. 
right? What are the comorbid conditions? What's the goal here? Those periodic nodes are metastatic disease. They're not regional disease. So you're dealing with a, a stage four disease at that time. If that's the only site of, of, of nodes and it's something that you're like, okay, there's a couple ones right here around the IMA chain up the aorta, then I think it's reasonable. If you're doing an extensive thing, I think you have to remember the cat's probably already out of the bag at this point if they're up in the periodic nodes. And so you just want to be, you don't want to be too aggressive and to cause more of a problem there. David, I was going to add in, David, if you don't mind, I was going to add in, I've, I've had two of these in the last two weeks um, and, you know, in tumor board here and, and Dr. Liska is always the, he's more, he's like the medical oncologist nihilist, you know, very negative about it, but because they are RP nodes and it's distant disease. But once again, if if they've been, and I'm more optimistic about it, and, and if they've been on treatment and there's nothing else blossoming anywhere, like you said, oligometastatic. I think we should go after them. There's a lot of these patients, a lot of them was 35 years old, 145 years old these last two weeks. And it is a little bit of a hairy situation and it's very difficult in there. But once again, if they've exhausted everything else and it's been a year or a year and a half since diagnosis and this is all that's remaining, one of them not too long ago, there was just really kind of bulky IMA nodes that were just kind of left behind from a previous operation done elsewhere. And I was able to get all that whole envelope out. So, you know, I think, I would go after them if there's nothing else going on and you could safely do it. And uh, both mine were open, but I think it would be a good opportunity for robotic uh, exposure in those cases, uh, potentially. Um, but great question. Yeah, I'm going to, and we've got a few more coming in. I'm going to go through these kind of rapid fire because we've got some great cases we want to get you to, but these are excellent questions. So I want to address them as well. So rapid fire, Dr. Gunter, low rectal cancer uh, that's got positive inguinal lymph nodes. Say that's the only site of disease. Do you go after those surgically? Do you radiate them? How do you uh, uh, deal with those? Yeah, that stuff, I we could ask a radiation oncologist about whether those will be included in their field. Um, I don't personally do inguinal lymph node dissections for rectal cancer. And I, I mean, I guess that would be a discussion to have a, a tumor board, but I think that would be considered um, definitely more metastatic disease than just locally advanced for sure. Definitely. I mean, I think they're covered, they would be covered in the chemo radiation field, similar to anal cancer would be, so they can be covered. Right. But yes, right. it, it, I agree with you. It's it's metastatic disease, and I think doing an inguinal risk dissection, you'd, you'd you'd have to have a perfect situation to be doing that for rectal cancer. Right. All right. How about uh, uh, Liska? What what therapy do you recommend for near obstructing cancers when you decide to perform diversion prior to neoadjuvant therapy? Right. So I think it really depends on symptoms. Uh, you know, it's hard. The degree of obstruction is hard to determine. You know, you can look at it on on the imaging on the MRI endoscopically. But generally speaking, if a patient is not symptomatic, most of them will get by by just starting quickly on chemo radiation. Most of them will get a response and won't require a diversion. Patients who are already symptomatic at the time that they present uh, usually will divert before. Great question about uh, with the periodic lymph nodes. Would you systematically clear or berry pick? I'll just answer quickly. I think you want to get out what you can see in that area. I mean, you're systematically clearing things, but you know at some point you have to stop as you're going up the aorta. Mike, would you would you agree with that or how would you go about taking out those periodic nodes? I, I agree with exactly what you said. Yeah, I wouldn't, nothing changes there. All right. Periodic lymph nodes are, to answer this question, are not included in lateral lymph node dissection, completely separate compartments. Uh, and then what kind of surveillance is indicated with watch and wait? How often should we uh, prescribe MRI and, and uh, endoscopy? Uh, Dr. Liska, you want to talk about real quick what our a surveillance protocol incorporates yeah. on our watch and wait. Our surveillance protocol is is kind of in line what's currently part of the new NCC and guidelines for watch and wait. So so we do, um, and endoscopic assessment we do it every three months. Uh, we do MRI every six months, CT chest, abdomen, pelvis every six months for the first three years, and then and then go to it, um, once a year every uh, for a total of five years. Great. Great. And Dr. Plante, last one yeah, before we both. get the last one before we get to the cases. After the Protege 7, still advising uh, cytoreductive surgery with HIPEC or just cytoreductive, HIPEC for, select, for selected cases, which ones? Yeah, great question. So, yes, still still advising CRS and HIPEC for those cases that you believe that you have a low PCI and you could do a complete cytoreduction. So, even if you have a low PCI but you can't get all out, I would not give chemotherapy in those. Now, if you're in a center that has been giving oxaliplatinin uh, for 30 minutes, I think that should be abandoned. That's very well established from the Protege 7 that, that oxaliplatin is not the drug of choice. So here, like I said, we use mitomycin C. There are other regimens out there. Once again, if you're able to get all of the tumor out and it's a low burden of disease, 
you should add to chemotherapy. If you're leaving stuff behind, chemotherapy is not a surrogate for good surgery. It will not fix the problem. So it's gotta be a combination of both getting it all out and having the right patient uh, there. Great, thanks everybody. Great questions, thanks for, and if you keep those coming, we'll try to address them later, but I do wanna jump into some of these cases because um, I think they, they raise some of the challenges and some of the issues that we see. So I'm gonna share my screen here and try to stump our panel. All right, so here we go. First patient, this is a 45-year-old healthy male police officer. He undergoes a colonoscopy for some rectal bleeding, shows a rectal mass five centimeters from the anal verge. Gets biopsy that's shown to be invasive, moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma. It's MMR proficient. Here's the endoscopy. You can see these pictures here. The CEA, in terms of the staging, CA is 0 0.8. He does not have any metastatic disease on his CT scans. On the MRI of the rectum, you can see a cut of it here. He's got a three centimeter right lateral mass that extends two, down to 2.2 centimeters from the sphincter complex or the anorectal junction. And there's two suspicious mesorectal lymph nodes. This is staged as a T2N1 on MRI. So now what? So Dr. Gunter, why don't we stop with you? What are our management options here? Uh, where do you go from here? Yeah, so I think in this person who has uh, positive lymph nodes and a low tumor, I think our, for our protocol would be to start with TNT, um, doing long course radiation and followed by chemotherapy, and then you know restaging it after each of those treatment modalities with an ultimate plan for, um, depending on his response, offering an operation to um, remove his tumor. All right, excellent. So that's exactly what this patient got. He got a total management strategy, long course chemoration followed by consolidation chemotherapy. His repeat MRI had no residual tumor and no residual lymph nodes. Had a repeat endoscopy, which you can see here. You can see the uh, tattoo that the initial gastroenterologist placed there on the left side of the screen and the, um, uh, the, the scar there on the bottom part of the screen there with the telangiectasia there. So now what would you do here? So Dave Liska, you're kind of our champion here of our, you know, the head of our, uh, uh, cancer center. So, what would is this? Is this something good? Is this not good? What would we do here? Yeah, this show, looks like a complete clinical response, and this patient would definitely be a candidate for uh, watch and wait. Great. Yeah, I mean, I think this is our class. This is your best case scenario. What you're kind of hoping for um, no disease anywhere, and he did opt for watch and wait. And two years out, he's now uh, no evidence of disease. All right, Dave. To really yeah. stump the the panel here, is, what if we go back to this case but make it a T two N zero? Well, we got that. Hey, don't that's hey, coming hey. up. Don't you worry about that case. That case is coming here. <laughs> all right, you you read my mind in terms of difficult cases. So, all right. So now we've got a seventy. This we start off easy. I got to warm you guys up. So we got a seventy year old male who's diabetic. He's hypertensive. Uh, undergoes a colonoscopy for rectal bleeding, and then shows a rectal mass two centimeters from the anal verge. Biopsy shows invasive adenocarcinoma. That's MMR proficient. Here's your endoscopy. You can see quite a large mass here on the side, uh, on the right side there. CEA is 2.8, no metastatic disease seen on CT scans. You get an MRI here. It's got a 6.7 centimeter right, right sided posterior mass that involves the internal anal sphincter, three suspicious mesorectal nodes, three right internal iliac lymph nodes that are suspicious. You can see here on the right side, this cut shows you a couple of those lymph nodes on the patient's right screen side left in that lateral compartment. I don't know if people can see my arrow, but if you can, I'm pointing them at them right there. And there also were two left-sided internal iliac and obturator nodes that are 1.3 and 1 centimeter. So labeled as a T3 N2. So Dr. Cantor, we have a, a what would you do with this patient with all this disease? Um, so T3 N2 uh, plan on total new adjuvant, and for our standard protocol, we would do long course followed by um, induction or sorry consolidation chemo, and then reevaluation. Right. All right, so he goes, he starts on that total new adjuvant therapy, long course chemo radiation plan for consolidation chemotherapy. His repeat MRI shows a moderate response. This is after TNT. Moderate response with the suggestion of a residual 5.2 centimeter mass that remains with still with internal sphincter involvement. The mesorectal nodes are gone, but there's a 0 0.5 centimeter and 0 .2, 0 0.5 centimeters, one on the right, one on the left, obturator nodes remain. Endoscopy is done and does not see any mass. Complete uh, uh, endoscopic, complete response. Now what? 
Dr. Valente, what would you do with this patient? Yeah, good case. Um, you know, you got those nodes that are still five millimeters in size. They were they they shrunk, but they're still there. Um, yeah, I mean, he needs in my in my hands an APR, um, and then I would do bilateral uh, pelvic lateral pelvic lymph node dissection. Uh, this would be a this would be a good case, uh, good robotic case. Dr. Liska, anything different? Yeah, it, it's it's a little strange. We don't see it very common that the MI shows a, a 5.2 centimeter mass and that, that we don't see anything on endoscopy. So I, I'd really sort of question the radiologist a little bit about what exactly they're seeing. You know, our radiologists um, have gotten very good at giving us the MR tumor regression grade and ask them um, what exactly are they seeing and how do we how do we reconcile it with our endoscopic findings? Um, we we have seen you know some of these patients where that we term a near complete response where the you know the MRI findings lag behind a little bit. So you know especially in a case like this um, where where the surgery is is obviously going to be a very extensive one. Uh, if this patient is kind of on his way to getting a complete response, um, I would potentially bring him if the MRI re is really equivocal. Um, I would bring him back and get a repeat MRI maybe in a couple of months to see if if maybe this patient has achieved a complete response. You're questioning the radiologists. You're questioning me in my case presentations. <laughs> I will assure everyone, despite his questioning tendencies, he's a delight to work with. <laughs> so, all right. So I actually lean more towards what Dr. Valente was saying. I did think it was quite interesting that there was such a dis uh, discordance between the MRI and the endoscopy findings. But I talked to the patient about everything, and they were motivated, motivated to go undergo surgery. So he underwent a robotic assisted abdominal perineal resection with a bilateral, bilateral pelvic lymph node dissection. Very interesting on his pathology. He had a single focus, one millimeter of residual adenocarcinoma in the uh, rectal specimen. All the mesorectal rectal lymph nodes were negative. And in the right, uh, right sided pelvic node dissection, zero out of 12 lymph nodes, and the left, zero out of five. So this is something I always wonder about in these patients. If we had waited, if we had waited, what would have happened to that one millimeter focus? Would it have continued to shrink and go away? Would it still have been there? Dr. Cantus, what do you think with that impossible question? Aaron, this, I mean, I answer doesn't even matter if the patient's down for surgery. That's a gold standard. Standard. I am really curious though. So did, you did this case. What did the tumor feel like? What was this 5.3 centimeter mass? So I think it was just fibrosis and, you know, everything uh -huh. was just, it was just looked, look, we, and we've seen that on these MRIs, like, like Dr. Lisk yeah. was mentioning, MRI kind of lags behind and you get this fibrosis and it's really challenging. So I, I think it just looks that way on the MRI. And then alternatively guys uh, and team, you know, we'll have a MRI that looks picture perfect. And then we have mucosal findings that are not, and then, and then, you know, get the other way around. So um, it goes both ways. And, uh, you know, but as Dr. Cantor said, Still, in the back of your mind, gold standard, you know, curative oncological surgery, you, you really can't go wrong. I mean, you can, but you, you, that's still your gold standard. So, yeah. All right, great. Moving on here. All right, we're going to get harder and harder. 71-year-old female with hypertension, BMI of 40. She presents after a screening colonoscopy shows a rectal mass. Pathology is invasive adenocarcinoma, MMR proficient. Endoscopy shows a four centimeter mass with a central depression distal to the distal rectal valve. On DRE, you feel a posterior mass just above the anal rectal ring. CA is 2.1. Again, no evidence of metastatic disease. Don't worry, Mike. I know you keep waiting for the stage four case. <laughs> the MRI of the rectum shows a 3.4 centimeter mass that extends 0 0.8 centimeters from the sphincter complex uh, in the anal rectal junction. It's read in the MRI as T1, T2, N0, Dr. Liska. Since you asked for this case, now what do you want to do? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough case, and it's becoming tougher and tougher as as we learn more. Um, in the past, actually, we would do endorectal ultrasound for for these cases to help differentiate between the T1 and T2s. And um, nowadays, that we we don't do the endorectal ultrasound so often, it's becoming a little bit of a lost art. Um, but you know, with this lady that you're describing, she's 71 years old. Um, I, I think. Depending on what the mass feels like and looks like, you could uh, consider doing a transanal excision. And the other consideration would be to start with chemo radiation. And you know, obviously, would not be standard protocol. But there are trials now that are um, uh, treating early early cancers that are very low down 
uh, with new adrenaline therapy op options. So the standard answer for her would be to start at least with a transanal excision, though. And David, uh, Liska, transanal, what, what about ESD, like what Dr. Gorgon does here, an endoscopic submucosal dissection, maybe not violating some planes uh for future tme what do you think about that it right. doesn't matter right no i that, that's you know what i said in terms of looking at the mass and what it looks like I, I think you know dr gorgon will tell you certain lesions are very easily amenable for esd whereas others not so much so i think it, it depends a little bit this one sounds like it's it's pretty low down and um, sometimes those can be tough you know they're tougher both both esd and with tamis because because of how low they are um, but yeah, if it looks like a very early lesion that's amenable to ESD, ESD is definitely, in my mind, the better option. Thank All you. right, so because you guys have declared that ESD is the better option, I took this patient for a robotic TAMIS. Uh, I do not perform ESD, and I think, you know, in TAMIS, same thing, you can do full thickness, you can do partial thickness. So I think that, um, you know, we have a great, uh, we're very, we have a great luxury to have Dr. Gorgon here and Dr. Somovio who do ESD and help us with these patients. But I think either is a good viable option. So this patient underwent a robotic TAMIS. The pathology was T2N0, negative margins, was moderately differentiated, no lymphovascular invasion, no perineural invasion, low tumor budding, so no high risk features there. Now what, Dr. Gunter? What do we do? Hmm. Yeah, so for a T2 cancer, the answer would typically be to move on to a proctectomy. Um, I think given the low uh, look at the location that would to likely would require an APR with it being so close to the anal verge or to the sphincter complex. Um, and then someone who's older and maybe wants to hope, hopes to avoid that kind of an operation, you could consider um, watching, although that's sort of more controversial in these T2 cancers. Um, I think that would require a conversation with the patient about um, her preferences and um, her risk tolerance um, in either direction about, you know, quality of life changes after surgery versus, you know, re cancer recurrence. Um, so I think those are yours for the two options are proctectomy versus continuing to watch that area very closely. Would anyone give uh, adjuvant rads or chemo or anything? David, Liska? Yeah, no, we, we've done that in such cases, you know, <laughs> like, like Dr. Gunther said, you know, Definitely the, the standard of care recommendation, because it's T2, the risk for lymph metastasis is relatively high. So, so the, the recommendation would be for TME. Um, but we've had um, patients who, who are poor functional status, uh, who would need an APR, who, know, who are refusing um, to have surgery. Uh, in those cases, adjuvant chemo radiation is one of the options we have used. And that uh, there are some studies that have shown that it definitely reduces the risk for, for recurrence, which makes sense. So, so I think that's, that's an option in these questionable cases. I have, I have three, maybe four like this over, over the last few years where refusing, they need APR, they're refusing it. So we give chemo rads and all of them, 100% are, are NED at this point, a few years out. So we'll see. But always remember that proctectomy is standard of care once again. And you have to document that and make sure you have that discussion with the patient. Right, right. And there's the NEO trial that, that was recently um, done, right, where they treated these relatively early cancers with new adjuvant chemotherapy and then did a local excision. And um, they have very promising results. Shout out to Dr. Simeonu, who is on the call, uh, part of that trial. It was an excellent, excellent trial with uh, promising results. And we'll see how that plays into our algorithm down the road. Good job, Vlad. So uh, this patient elected for active surveillance. As everyone had mentioned, we, she understood that the recommendation was for formal proctectomy. Given her um, age, her comorbidities, her, her, she would have a hard time, I think, with a lot of low, low anterior resection syndrome if I were to do an LAR. And she was most interested in her quality of life, and she wanted to go with that. So that's what she opted to do. All right, next patient, 43-year-old male, BMI 45, presents with rectal bleeding. Colonoscopy shows an ascending colon mass and a rectal mass. Pathology shows invasive adenocarcinoma MMR proficient on both masses. Endoscopy, here's your rectal mass on endoscopy. This is after a biopsy. This is, I saw you look like that, Liska. This was not my picture. Don't judge me like that. <laughs> All right, so the CA 1.0, CT chest and pelvis has two small liver lesions. You get an MRI of the liver, which shows a 10 millimeter lesion in the possible metastasis in the right lobe. You can see here, which I'm pointing at, which I think you guys can see my arrow. We can see it. Great. 
MRI of the rectum shows a 6.4 centimeter left-sided tumor abutting and possibly invading the internal anal sphincter. Positive mesorectal nodes, stage T3 N2. Dr. Valente, now what are we gonna do? We got two cancers. We got a big rectal mass, got a right-sided colon cancer. We got the suspicious liver lesion. What do we do? Yeah, the, uh, the livers, we, uh, so for the rectum, so we have double, we have a synchronous lesions, we have colon and rectum, we got liver masses. Um, you could treat, uh, I don't know. Well, you, we could talk about, it's a good, it's a good one, Dave, I don't know. Uh, we could give short course to the rectum and take out the colon. We can give long course chemo radiotherapy to the rectum. Uh, I like to figure out what's going to deliver though. So we, we got to figure out what's going to deliver. So biopsy of some form before we do anything else, just to make sure we're really talking about stage four here. Uh, fair point, fair point. Lisco, what do you think? I think Valente is punting. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I would bring it the tumor board and, uh, <laughs> and discuss. It's a tough case. It's a really tough case. I think, um, you know, one thing though that jumps out at me, you know, he's 43 years old, has two synchronous cancers with liver meds. Yeah. And, you know, you said it's MMR proficient. Correct. Um, so I would still recommend genetic testing uh, in this guy. You know, he could have, you know, if the, you know, if you trust your pathologist and the immunist, the chemistry 100%, then it, it could still be, you know, mute YH associated polyposis could be something. So definitely, Genetic testing is definitely something that needs to be done for anybody under the age of 50. You know, we might be moving to doing it for everyone with any colorectal cancer at any age, but in a 43 year old with two synchronous cancers, um, definitely something that, that I'd want to do. Uh, in terms of treating his current disease, like Dr. Valente said, there, there are several options. You know, I would, I think short course to start with is definitely um, a good idea. Uh, you know, start with local control and also gives you some time to figure to figure things out. And the problem is, um, you know, the short course obviously won't treat the, the right colon cancer or the, or the liver cancer. So, you know, one option would be to do short course, then do um, either take out everything then with surgery, you know, right? That's a, that's a reasonable option. You do, you do a, a right colectomy and APR um, and a liver wedge resection, right? You know, I think that that would be a reasonable option. Uh, now, if the patient is very much opposed to an APR and we want to give him a chance, you know, to, to have downstaging, then you can do short course and then do a right colectomy. And then at the same time as a right colectomy, you know, you can biopsy and ablate the liver and then move on to chemotherapy and then see what the response is. All right. Yeah. So challenging case. I'm glad I got to, to, to torch you guys a little bit with that one. So we were... In my mind, the, what I want to do here with concern for stage four disease is, like Dr. Valente said, prove it, and then also get them to chemotherapy, right? Because the state, the distant metastasis is going to be the thing. So we, uh, that's the thing that's going to determine his mortality. So we opted for short course radiation, and I'll sort of go through this quicker than I wanted because we're just about out of time. And then five days later, did a combination laparoscopic right colectomy, which showed a T1N0 right-sided colon cancer, and a liver biopsy with ablation, and the biopsy showed uh, cancer in the liver mat as well. One month postoperatively, he started systemic chemotherapy. I elected to not do the APR at that time. I think that's a reasonable thought, Dr. Lisk, but given how aggressive or, or extensive that me mesorectal disease was, also invading into the sphincter, I thought some downstaging would help, especially with this BMI of 45 narrow pelvis. I thought any chance, any the maximum downstaging by waiting, giving the radiation time to work and doing some systemic chemo would be a good idea. So the repeat MRI showed a moderate response um, with uh, residual 1.5 centimeter mass, more than 50% fibrosis. The mesorectal nodes were gone. It was still abutting or invading the internal sphincter. Endoscopy showed this, just some residual polypoid tissue seen in the distal rectum, which you can see here. So now what? I won't torture you because we're just about out of time, so I'll just sort of show you. I was concerned still about this mesorectal or about this polypoid tissue, um, and given how aggressive this was, uh, that the MRI did not show a, a, a it was an MRTRG3 rather than a 2 or a 1. So he underwent a robotic assisted uh, APR at that time. And similar to the other case I talked about, there was a residual focus of adenocarcinoma associated with the tubular villus adenoma. It was a T1N0. And he's now no evidence of disease three and a half years out. 
So really good response there. And the last thing I'll just talk about real quick is I'll just run through this case. This is a 49 year old healthy female presented to the emergency room with obstructive symptoms. Here's her CAT scan going from left to right in the far left picture. You can see several uh, bilobar liver lesions. Next case, next slide is showing all the stool and throughout the colon. So she's got some degree of obstruction. You see the mass here in the upper rectum as it comes on down in the third slide and the right side and the fourth slide, you see a, a lung met there as well. So met's the liver and lung. She had a, a fungating mass at the mid rectal valve that was 10 centimeters from the anal verge. The scope could barely get past into the sigmoid colon, which is consistent with kind of the obstructive symptoms she was having. Uh, and the biopsy showed adenocarcinoma. You can see it here. And what we ended up doing for this is she had an adequate distal landing zone. So we actually utilized a colonic stent placement uh, in this case. Usually we can't really use it that often for rectal cancer, but in this case, you know, this was an upper rectal mass and, you know, this was concerned that this was going to be a palliative uh, type of case and she was young and did not want to live her life with a stoma. So just something to remember, stents have a lot of issues and can have complications, but I think sometimes they can be used effectively. And this is one that at one time that we did that. All right, with that, I'm gonna stop this sharing. Thanks so much for joining everybody. Um, we're out of time. There's so many still great questions there. I'm sorry we didn't get to it. We just didn't have enough time. Uh, again, if you want any of those answered, you can email Rita and she'll get the questions out to us and we'll get back and try to respond. Um, I don't know if you wanna bring up the wrap up slides here. Perfect, so here's how you can, a reminder about a CME credit. You can scan the QR code on your screen with your phone and follow the prompts. And then the, the details and the PowerPoint handouts will be sent to all attendees tomorrow. And also, I'd like to remind everyone to join us for our upcoming programs. On April 26th, Dr. Herman Kessler is going to be talking about improving survival in uh, colon cancer. And then we'll have a live from Cleveland Clinic with the management of acute pancreatitis led by Dr. Matt Walsh uh, on uh, uh, May 10th. So thanks again to the panel. Thanks, everyone, for hosting or for being here. And we'll see you next time live from Cleveland Clinic.